Here's an interesting picture of the moon you might have seen before. One might wonder what all those colors present. Well, this is an assembled picture of many images that the Galileo spacecraft took on its way to Jupiter while passing the moon back in the early 1990s. A few years ago, NASA took those images, combined them in what you can see here, and false colored them in order to indicate the abundance of all the different resources in each area of the near side of the moon. But why would they need such a picture? Just to study the moon for scientific purposes or there is something else? Well, the reason is probably the same as the reason why all those other governments and private entities have their eyes on the moon as well. Because what is one of the most essential things our technologically powered society depends on nowadays? Well, it's energy. Everything nowadays needs some form of energy to run. All the different kinds of machinery and electronics that we use in pretty much every aspect of our society, like communication, business, transportation, industry, production, and so on. This is why figuring out energy, the resources we use, the way we produce, how we capture it, optimization and spendings are some of the paramount questions of our society in 21st century. And energy is going to be getting more and more essential. In fact, the Kardashev scale measures the advancements of a civilization by the quantity of energy it can possess and operate with. There are three types of civilizations in this scale developed by Nikolai Kardashev, a Soviet astronomer. And as according to the American astronomer Carl Sagan, humanity is currently going through a phase of technical adolescence which means we are on the way to become only type 1 civilization. A type 1 civilization is usually defined by the capability to harness all the energy that reaches its planet from its star, or in our case, all the energy that reaches Earth from the Sun. In the past couple of decades, more and more eyes are setting on the moon as I mentioned. For example, the funding NASA has received from the government of the United States has increased gradually for the past few years with about 6-7% to each year. And there is another increase of 7% planned for the budget for 2024. So their Artemis program, which is specifically focused on sending people to the moon, receives a bigger piece of the cash respectively with each coming year. On the other side of the globe, Russia's Roscosmos has set the launch of their Luna 25 for July the 13th this year, which is Russia's first mission to go back to the moon since the Soviet Union. India has also planned their second mission to the moon for July this year, along with Japan in August, where the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency has prepared their first ever moon lander called SLIM, which stands for Smart Lander for Investigating the Moon. China has set their eyes on the moon as well. Their Chinese National Space Administration has landed three spacecrafts on the moon already, Chang'e 3, 4 and 5, as part of the Chinese Lunar Exploration Program. And they have planned two more missions of two other spacecrafts for the early 2024. They have stated that they will be focusing on gathering more information about mining an interesting isotope on the moon, Helium-3, which we will talk about in a minute. And there are other players like the European Space Agency, Israel, Germany and other countries, as well as numerous space private startup companies. So what is this sudden interest in the moon? Simply in the name of exploration and discovery, or just so it becomes a spacefaring species? Well, in some way maybe. Maybe there are some people that want to do it in the name of the adventure, or just because they want to put their names in the history books. But the biggest incentive that lies above everything after all, is the smell of the profits related to mining on the moon. It's pretty much the same competition as the colonization here on earth back in the days. It was hard for Columbus to make anybody fund his trips initially, but once they saw the profits after discovering the new world, it became a fervent competition for resources and lands between between European kingdoms, which ended up in colonizing the whole world. The difference now is that the moon doesn't have any gold or other previously valued metals or resources, but it does hold plenty of essentials for a society like ours, and the potential economy we can develop around moon mining could bring a lot of overall value to society. Let me explain. In a society of growing dependence on technology in virtually all aspects, the demand for rare earth metals and other elements which are scarce or really hard to get kind of pushes us to look for them elsewhere outside our planet. The perfect starter would be the moon, especially with all the emerging technologies which will make this feasible. So what is there on the moon that is so valuable? Well, there are three categories of resources. The first category is the in-situ utilization of resources that will be used as material to build moon bases and cover other necessities on the moon. The second category is highly valuable minerals and compounds that are so expensive on Earth because of their rarity or difficulty to obtain that it is more economically viable to mine them on the moon and take them back home. And the third is the moon itself, the location and its physical properties. So what is there on the moon that we can use to build the first settlements there? In the first place is the moon's regolith, which is pretty abundant to say the least and is easily obtainable. It could perfectly be used as building material for any settlers there for protection from cosmic radiation, as well as it could be used as paving material and all other kinds of stuff. There is this Australian company, Luten, which is looking to deploy 3D printing technology to provide on-site construction solutions. Also, it was found out a couple of years ago that the regolith contains about 45% oxygen. Even though it's not in a gaseous form, it could easily be turned into a breathable 
soluble oxygen through a process called electrolysis. Most of the oxygen along with some liquid water are found in the shades of crates all over the moon, mostly in the areas of the moon poles. Ice is also pretty abundant and can be used as fuel. There is also plenty of sun exposure especially on the moon poles where on some areas the sun shines pretty much all the time. And when you add the lack of wind and clouds, producing solar energy would be as easy as a child's play. Some food can be produced locally but there could be also a constant stream of deliveries of food supplies back and forth to earth. The moon has also enough of hydrogen which combined with oxygen can produce clean water. All of these can support settlements on the moon. There is a plethora of other materials, some of which could have enormous economic value if delivered back on Earth and used in the production of all kinds of stuff like energy, electronics, building batteries, solar panels, virtually everything. Let's take a look at the color picture again. The bright pinkish areas present the lunar highlands consisting of calcium-rich white rocks. The dark blue areas are rich in titanium. Light blue and light green colors present areas rich in thin minerals and soils not commonly found on Earth. Some blue Bluish and orange areas indicate sections where basaltic lava has flown before, therefore those areas are especially packed with iron. The lunar rocks also contain a lot of the so-called refractory elements such as calcium, aluminum and as mentioned titanium, as well as a high abundance of materials such as silicon and oxygen. The regolith contains plenty of nickel and cobalt as well. The moon is abundant in one other interesting element, helium-3, which of all other elements on the moon represents the most significant potential in the field of energy. Helium-3 is especially situated in those titanium-rich basaltic lava areas. This is a very attractive isotope which could be used in the production of clean nuclear energy with no radiation whatsoever and no dangerous byproducts. Helium-3 could be used in the process of fusing the helium-3 isotope with deuterium which is an isotope of hydrogen. After the fusion of these two we get helium-4 and a lot, a lot of energy. Just for comparison, a kilogram of helium-3 deuterium fuel can produce 4.2 million times more energy than a kilogram of hydrogen fuel. While those type of nuclear reactors are still in experimental stages, we are seeing improvements in nuclear energy production constantly. Other than that, the problem with helium-3 is that it is extremely rare here on Earth. It's found in some gas deposits around the planet but it's usually in extremely small amounts and it's not economically viable to extract and collect. Helium-3 could also be produced as a byproduct of the radioactive decay of tritium used in nuclear warheads. But we don't want to stockpile tritium just for that, thus increase the radioactive waste, right? On the moon however, being bombarded with solar winds for centuries reaching helium-3 with no atmosphere to deflect them, from what we can tell there should be about 1.1 million metric tons of helium-3. And not only it is abundant but it is also easily reachable as it is usually contained around the surface or only within a few meters below the surface and could be extracted by heating the regolith and capturing the elements. The production of 100 kilograms of helium-3 per year would require annual mining and processing of about 2 square kilometers of the lunar surface to a depth of 3 meters as accounted in the book of Harrison Schmidt, a geologist and retired NASA astronaut. Just so we can get some idea, 25 metric tons of helium-3, which is about a quarter of the cargo capacity of a SpaceX Starship would suffice to fuel all the power needs of the United States for a year, one of the most energy demanding countries in the world. That is why China is betting on this hard. Their mission Chang'e 4 and 5 provided essential information and data on the topography and composition of the lunar soil. That would be one of the main focuses of their future moon missions. Right now, the Beijing Research Institute of Uranium Geology is measuring the content of helium-3 in the lunar soil, evaluating its extraction parameters and studying the ground fixation of this isotope. Access to lunar helium-3 at competitive cost potentially offers an environmentally benign means of helping to meet an anticipated ninefold or higher increase of energy demands by 2050, as the population is expected to hit well over 10 billion people and as many countries are entering the developed list of countries where we will see an increasing energy demands. And last but not least, maybe one of the most important group of elements are the rare earth metals, which are not so rare on earth but for the most part are hard to obtain. They are usually not found in big deposits but but rather scattered all around the Earth's crust. Therefore, mining them here on Earth is really energy demanding and usually comes with a lot of pollution. There are large deposits of them in several parts of the world. However, the only country that mines big quantities of rare earths is China, which in fact holds 95% of the market of those elements. But the moon has plenty of them all over. So with a constantly growing market for electronics and especially now electric car batteries, we would be needing more and more of those. Thus, the moon starts to look more attractive. 
Rare earths from the moon will bring a lot of economic value and will push prices of electronics and electric cars down to the bottom. As SpaceX is trying to solve problems of launch costs, and if they succeed in doing so, the technology for regular flights to the moon might become a real thing very soon. A thriving lunar economy will make off-world activity profitable and it will greatly expand the number of missions taking place. It will also increase our knowledge of the moon, other space bodies, and it will teach us a lot about how our human body can bear such conditions and to what extent. It will also be a ground for more technological advancements in rocketry and space travel. The moon holds the potential to be the best place to truly getting into space. Colonizing the moon would help us move a huge part of the industry into low earth orbit or on the moon itself, thus eliminating the detrimental effects of it on our planet. Many products could be manufactured there and if the prices of missions from and to the moon eventually drop to profitable minimums, they can simply be transported to earth and put into the market. The moon is gonna become a fueling station and a launch path for missions to Mars, the solar system and deep space. If we learn how to use helium-3 or create rocket fuel from the regolith, together with the lack of atmosphere and the sixth of the gravity, it will make it way cheaper and easier to launch spacecrafts from the surface of the moon compared to Earth. In fact, it's so much easier to deliver from the moon all the way to low Earth's orbit, a distance of about 400,000 kilometers, than to ship anything from the Earth's surface to low Earth orbit, a distance which is about a thousand times shorter. The weaker gravity has other advantages also. We can manufacture and build without the need of a sturdy industrial machines as we have here on Earth. The lack of winds, rain and snow or any weather conditions makes building bigger way cheaper. The moon is also a great place to do controversial or hazardous biological experiments without the risk of harming the nature or any life or risking any outbreaks. And as we said, the moon has plenty of hydrogen which can be used as rocket fuel. The lack of atmosphere and the weaker gravity will make it possible to build spacecrafts with smaller engines, therefore less material used and less need of protection. And if we obtain normal quantities of helium-3 and crack the tech behind building fusion reactors for clean energy, building rockets will become even more feasible. There is just so much to be said about the moon, but those will be topics for future videos. For now, I will leave you here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.